Hello everyone and my name is Liz Gillis and I am delighted to be taking part in this year's John DeVoy seminar and I'm going to talk about um, volunteer Dan Head who was killed at the Bourne Not Custom House in May 1921. So if you bear with me I'm just going to share my screen and Yeah. So, um, OK, Dan Head, um, who was he and what was his his young life like um, and how did he become involved um, in the IRA and become involved or take part in one of the seminal events that happened during the War of Independence? That's what we're going to look at with this talk today. So um, Dan Head. Um, he was from Dublin. He was born in Hollis Street in 1903. Um, and he was one of six children born to uh, Michael and Mary Head. He was actually the second um, child. His older sister had actually died when she was only a baby. So Dan was actually the eldest surviving child of the, the Head's six children. Um, in 1909, quite unusually, the family moved to Brussels in Belgium. Now, this was because his father, Michael Head, um, it was very difficult to get work in Ireland and he had the World's Fair um, was being put on in Belgium. So he managed to find work there. And so the whole family up sticks and moved over uh, to Brussels. The family didn't stay there very long. Um, Mary Head, Dan's mother, moved back to Ireland um, in 1911 because on the census they're back in Ireland but his father was, was still away um, and at that stage they returned when they did return they were living in Charleville Mall and um, they had many addresses around the north inner sea um, but it's around the area that you will find Dan all of his life um, currently place and so on and while here, he attended school in uh, North William Street and later Marino. And Dan, there was, a, he came from a, a political family. And um, if you look back to his grandfather, um, Daniel Head, his namesake, um, he was a member of the Fenians and also the Invincibles and took part in the 1867 rebellion. And that's actually mentioned in a couple of newspapers and so on. So you have this, this, this lineage um, of revolutionary activity in Dan's family so it doesn't it doesn't surprise people like so many others that um dan followed in the footsteps of um an ancestor you have it with james slattery as well who was also involved in the born of the custom house in 1921 his grandfather had been involved um in the fenian campaign um but here we have a photograph of dan um, when he was a baby um, and you can see they're dressed like a, a little girl um, but that wasn't unique at that time this was typical um, of the period so here we have his parents and um, now here's his dad Michael on the right and here we have his mother Mary and she was Mary Hammond and um, before she got married um, and these obviously these photographs are taken in later life now Dan's father he did work away from home for uh, quite a long period of time and then he did return uh, to Ireland around 1917-1918 but what were Dan's interests? Well, he had quite a few, actually. Um, and one of his big interests was ferreting. And he actually had a ferret. And he and his father would go out ferreting, um, usually on the weekends, Sunday afternoons and so on. If he wasn't playing football or being involved in, in volunteer meetings um, or bushes, um, he was ferreting. Um, it's something, the passion that he had. But the other passion that he had in his life was football. Now, he was goalkeeper for Fairview Celtic, and here you see a photograph of the uh, football team. And I have to say a huge, huge thank you to uh, Michael McKay, who was Dan's nephew, um, for allowing me to, to, to use the photographs um, and for helping me with the information, the research on Dan's early life and family life. But here we have Dan pretty much centre of the photograph circle here. And as I mentioned, he was the goalkeeper of Fairview Celtic and uh, quite a good team. Um, he was a very good goalkeeper, um, so so much so that in 1920, uh, Fairview Celtic won the uh, Leinster uh, Minor Cup final. Um, here we have the medal for that. And of course, this is the awarded to Dan Head. He didn't let a single goal go through in that match. Um, the following year, 
actually shortly before the Bourne the Custom House, they again made it to the final. Um, but that year they weren't lucky, they didn't win, but they were semi-finalists in anyway. And here we have another photograph of Dan. There's very few photographs um of Dan, but you can see from all of them, he was so young. Um, like many volunteers um at that time, they were young men, um, just pretty much boys. So um here we have this photograph and showing Daniel Head from Fairview Celtic Football Club and the medal that he won in 1920. Now, around 1918, um, Dan became an apprentice carpenter. Um, one of the places that he worked in was uh, Kelly's Building Contractors, and that was in Smithfield. Um, but what how did Dan go from being a, a, an ordinary boy, you know, playing football and ferreting and so on, um, to becoming a revolutionary? And like so many of the young men, around the country at that time, the East Horizon had a profound effect on him. Um, now, he didn't live too far away from the Horizon, where when the Horizon uh, happened, um, you know, he's on stone's throw away from the, the main thoroughfare, O'Connell Street, where the, the general headquarters, or sorry, the headquarters of the Irish volunteers were in the GPO. Now, he would not stay in Jordan East Derby. He wanted to get out. He was sussing out what was happening. He wants to know what was happening in and around O'Connell Street. Um, and of course, the aftermath has a huge, huge impact on him and it, it radicalised him like so many of his comrades would be. Um, and Dan joined Nafina in 1917. So he was only 14 years old at that time. Now, the thing with Nafina was once generally boys turned 18 years of age, then they graduated to the Irish Volunteers or what became known as the IRA. Um, but Dan didn't wait until he turned 18 because he became a member of D Company of the 2nd Battalion, Dublin Brigade of the IRA in 1919. Um, and he was only 16 years old at that time. Now, it has been said in relation to the burning of the Custom House in May 1921 that it, a lot of the uh, men or young men that were involved uh, were inexperienced that this was their first foray into into battle um but that was not the case certainly in relation to dan dan was a seasoned volunteer he was an experienced volunteer um and just to to sort of mention go through some of the activities that he was involved in so he was regularly out um, um ambushing military uh patrols um his preferred method of operation uh, was to throw grenades at the passing tenders. Um, and there are accounts where, um, from, thankfully, from a, a journal, a diary um, that his younger brother kept, where he talks about Dan coming home and talking to his dad um, about what he was involved in, um, about different ambushes that took place around Hardwick Street, North Frederick Street, Dorset Street, all of that area. Um, but there was one particular instance, and it was a failed attempt, and there were many attempts to get this man in particular. He's seen this image, and this is Eugene I Ago, and he was a head constable in the RIC. Um, now, in the War of Independence, the latter stages of the War of Independence, you had this group called the Igo Gang, which is headed by this man. Um, and they were made up of RIC detectives from around the country. Um, and they were based in Dublin to identify volunteers that might have come up to Dublin from the country and um, because it was it was too too dangerous for them down in the country to stay in the locality so come up to dublin where it would be safer um and the reason that this happened is because um you had british intelligence who were very very active um against michael collins against the ira in dublin and um, you have the events on sunday where michael collins sent his assassins out to assassinate those british agents and although it didn't destroy british intelligence um it certainly was a severe blow to them. So when they reorganized, they raised a group, this group led by Eugene Igo, using local uh, detectives from around the country based in Dublin to identify um, IRA men that might be in Dublin. Um, and they operated on similar lines, uh, like Michael Collins' squad, in that they didn't go around in their uniforms, their police uniforms, they were in civilian clothes, and they would just appear out of nowhere. And um, there's an, a, an account by Charlie Dalton, one of Collins's intelligence officers, where he had a, a very close encounter with Igo um, and his men 
um, in, in, in Dublin in just like broad daylight or in around Grafton Street. And the chap that he was with, uh, volunteer Charles Newell, he was he was taken away by Iguana's men and got an unmerciful hiding. Um, they were very ruthless in their tactics. And they became, that group became a huge, huge thorn inside of the IRA. And despite many attempts, they the IRA failed to get Igo and his men, and um, despite their best efforts. But we have in in an attempt on Igo, in which Dan was involved, um, and it is one of the many attempts that did fail to to get Igo. So what we had just to sort of go back a little bit, the the War of Independence began in January 1919. It lasts for two and a half years, and in Dublin you had um five battalions of the IRA in the Dublin Brigade. So you had the 1st and 2nd battalions which operated on the north side of the city, the sword and force operated on the south side of the city, and then the 5th battalion was called the engineers, and that was made up of men from the other four battalions, their, 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 their um, expertise in communications and engineering, that's what they're used for, so they have their own, um, their own battalion. So Dan is a member of the 2nd battalion because they operate from O'Connell Street down to uh, the, the North Strand, East Wall, out as far as Fairview and so on. And the command an officer of the second battalion at the time of the war of independence was a man called Tom Ennis. Um, so these are just the, 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 his leader um, and the company that he was involved in, the company second battalion. Now, what happened in the war of independence? Um, you have 1919 dominated by assassinations um, in intelligence and so on. You have the G-men, the political police being uh, assassinated by Collins's men. Um, around the country, you have the, the ambush has taken place on the RIC because they're the, the force used down across the country. And then they were reinforced in 1920 by the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries. So the Black and Tans, a full time unit, they were the police. They were like the, the recruits because you couldn't get people recruit to join the RIC, whereas the Black, the Auxiliaries, um, they were a, a sort of an independent unit that were a, a part time force. So literally for as long as this conflict lasted, that's how long the auxiliaries would be in existence, whereas the Black and Tans, they would be the police force even after um, the conflict was over. But with their arrival, things really, really um, heated up. Um, the Black and Tans and auxiliaries, there's a trail of devastation left behind them were everywhere um, throughout the country. And they were they were fearless men and they were feared by the people of Ireland. Um, and when, when it comes to the auxiliary, certainly the IRA, um, some of them did say that, you know, they prefer to be arrested by uh, British military rather than the auxiliaries. All it serves in the First World War and in the case of the auxiliaries, that was made up of men who are officers in the British Army who had served in the First World War. Um, but 1920, it, it escalates, the campaign escalates, and um, certainly by the end of the year, you have the IRA suffering um, some losses, uh, some big losses, Sean Tracy was killed in Talbot Street, you have the death of Terence McSweeney on hunger strike, you have the execution of Kevin Barry in Mountjoy Jail in November 1920, and it looked like the IRA were on its knees, but that's the way this war uh, was fought, that the IRA it looks like they get are defeated, but then they come back, and by God, they come back with uh, the events on the 21st of November 1920, which, of course, is Bloody Sunday, where Colin sent out his men to assassinate those British agents, followed a week later by the Carmichael ambush down in West Cork, um, led by Tom Barry and the Tour of West Cork Brigade flying column. Um, it's followed down by the, the Born in the Cork City in December 1920. And then January 1921, it opens. And again, it is executions of IRA men around the country. And again, it looks like uh, the, the, the IRA were on its knees. But who was missing from the sort of the, the Ireland at this time was Eamon de Valera. So he had been in America um, since the middle of 1919 and he had been on a lecture tour and he was trying to get American recognition of the Irish Republic um, and of course raising huge amounts of money for the, uh, the Dáil Loan and the Republican movement. But one thing Eamon de Valera saw was how events in Ireland were being portrayed 
um, by the media, by the international press. And this was not being seen as a, a war between two countries. The IRA were not seen as an army. They were called murderers, assassins. It was murder gangs and so on. Um, and one aspect of the War of Independence, one feature is propaganda. That was a very, very, very powerful weapon. And the Republicans knew the value of propaganda. And Eamon de Valera realized that we have to change this. So he came back from America in December 1920 and immediately calls a meeting of the Army Council. And he discusses what he has, um, what he has witnessed while he was away in America. And he didn't like what he was seeing. So basically, he puts it to Collins and Richard Mulcahy and Carl Brewer and so on that the IRA in Dublin certainly needs to change their tactics. They need to have um, spectacular events, spectacular attacks, um, firstly to, to draw international attention on Ireland and to show the world as well that this was a conflict between two countries, this was actually a war. So Oscar Trainer, who was the brigade, the, sorry, the, the, com the commandant of the Dublin Brigade of the IRA, um, he's at this meeting and he was basically told, look, have a look at a few targets, choose some targets around Dublin that, that might be sort of that could be potential targets and he looked at Burgers Bush Barracks that was the headquarters of the auxiliaries in Dublin and after carrying out intelligence on that target or that um, um the, the, the barracks it was decided that that would be too risky it would be pretty much a suicide mission if they tried to attack Burgers Bush so that's pretty much packed then their are attentions torn to the custom house now I must say that the custom house was always in the sights of the IRA um, as far back as 1918. Dick McKee, who was the previous commandant of the Dublin Brigade, he suggested attacking the Custom House in 1918 in response to the threat of conscription and um, when the British government were, were trying to introduce conscription to Ireland. Despite the fact that the volunteers had very few weapons, that they were only reorganising after 1916, he was planning a mini 1916 where they were going to isolate the Custom House and um, isolate all the streets surrounding the Custom House um, and they would each street would be in command or be commanded by a local local volunteer, but they, they could hold their own, the, the military barracks, they would be all isolated with barricades erected throughout the, the streets, so it would delay the military from getting to the centre, which would be, would be the custom house. And that plan was put forward to general headquarters um, of the volunteers, which includes Collins, um, and it didn't go ahead because conscription wasn't introduced. But Dick McKay, I don't know, for whatever reason, he just had something about the Custom House and he again in 1920 wanted to put forward a, a suggestion to um, attack the Custom House. Now, GHQ didn't sanction that attack in 1920 because, not because it was a, a bad idea or a, a military operation or a bad plan, it was the fact that they had something much bigger in mind, which was to burn the local income tax offices around the country, because what you had in the Custom House was inland revenue. Um, income tax records, but they were copies of the records. So the idea was to destroy the original records in the, what was a spectacular coup on the night of the 3rd and 4th of April 1920. It was, to, it was the fourth anniversary of the Eastern Horizon, and the authorities suspected that something might happen, that the volunteers might do something, that the IRA might you know, stage a rebellion is what they taught. And you put a ring of steel up around Dublin. There's photographs and barricades and everything. And, you know, newspapers are full of, of, of what, were, what they were trying to do to stop this. And they were caught completely off guard because on the night of the 3rd and 4th of April, the whole country went on fire because the IRA all across the country. Not only did they succeed in burning the income tax records, and in some cases, the, the buildings, the income tax offices, um, they also succeeded in burning the evacuated RIC barracks or something like 300 burnt or so on. So this was a huge, huge propaganda coup for the IRA. But what it meant was, is that the copies of those documents were in one nice place, which was the Custom House. Now, when it comes to 1921, the Custom House was the one of the sort of last iconic 
buildings of the British administration in Ireland. It was the symbol of the British civil administration in Ireland. Um, in 1920, um, it was the, the you had the Department of Local Government housed there, and by 1920, with the local election, Sinn Féin had won control of all of those councils, the rural district councils, and so on. So this is a huge, huge symbol. And Oscar Trainer, followed by Tom Menace, um, they carried out. A, a sort of a, a recce on this building. They began to, to suss her out um, get information, get maps. And they were also helped very easily in this fact by or with, with this work by the fact that a number of IRA men worked in the custom house. So they carried out their intelligence. Um, it was very easy to do it. Um, Oscar Trainer himself stated that he just walked around the building. He carried a brown envelope, an official looking envelope, and just walked around the building. And he was spotting where rooms were, um, how to get in, how to get out. Nobody stopped him. And he then gives that information to Tom Ennis, his, basically his uh, next in line, the commandant of the 2nd Battalion, tells him to go and have a look. And he does the same, just walked in and around the building, nobody stopped him. But after carrying out all of this surveillance, it was decided that, that the customers would be the most logical target. And this is the, the reason why. So you have all of the local government records were held in the custom house and just to name a few departments and um, you've got the ones that were going to be used for setting up of the new parliament in uh, the new state of northern ireland all the tax files for ireland inland revenue local government state duty control registers stamp office income tax and joint stock company registers now eamon de valera um, he believed that if the, the, the contents and the whole idea was to destroy the contents of the building, not to destroy the building, but if this attack came off and um, its destruction would reduce the most important branch of British civil government in Ireland to virtual impotence and would, in addition, inflict on our financial loss of about two million pounds. So basically, once it's decided that they would attack the custom house, then of course the plan put into place. So you've got three months spent planning the operation. Harry Colley, who was a volunteer, um, he walked in the custom house and he basically tells them where to go um, when they get into the building, the wills room, which was under the dome. It was essential that they burned that part of the building because firstly it was um basically the the, the rooms were made of wood um, and because it was a dome it was like a chimney so that would act as a chimney when the contents would be set ablaze and the whole idea was that volunteers from from the second battalion they would be the ones that would go into the building under tom ennis because this was in their area this building was in the second battalion area and they would be the ones inside the building now oscar trainer because he was a second battalion man he wanted to take elements of Dick McKay's earlier plans from 1918, 1920, and that he wanted to erect barricades in the streets um, where the military barracks were. So that if during the attack war got through to the military, that something was happening, at least they would be then delayed because there would be volunteers manning the barricades and they would engage the military. So delay them from getting into the custom house. Um, also, Oscar Trainer wanted his men of the 2nd Battalion to be protected. So he wanted the other battalions of Dublin Brigade of the IRA to be involved as well. Now, Michael Collins steps in here and he has a problem with the barricades. And he basically believed that if you erected barricades throughout the city near the military barracks, that would be like 1916 again. And he was saying, no way, not going to happen. So he actually demands from Oscar Trainer that the barricades are not going up um, and also the amount of men that would be used and he basically sort of pushes Oscar Trainer. Oscar Trainer doesn't push back there is a compromise reached where okay the barricades aren't going to be erected and um, but Oscar Trainer still wants that protection from the other battalions and he brings them they're brought in closer so you do have members of the fourth sword and fourth battalions that would be given protective cover in the immediate vicinity um of the the, the custom house and it's that part of the plan that gets messed up and who messed it up is michael collins because if the barricades had been erected the military would have been delayed um, getting to the custom house and um, so where you have a, an element um of where it goes wrong it's thanks to michael collins stepping in and demanding that oscar trainer doesn't go through erecting the barricade
right? Um, but the other thing that is said about the custom house is that um, 120 men took part in the operation. So that 120 men were the core group of the second battalion drum brigade that would go into the building, supported by members of the active service unit, which was the full time unit um, of the IRA, <clears throat> made up about 50 men. And he had members from the second battalion, number two section of the active service unit. They were second battalion men and also some members of the squad that would be inside the building. And there we have Oscar Trainer and Tom Ennis. So the commandant of the drum brigade and then the commandant of the second battalion drum brigade and um, the main planner and then the man who would oversee the operations on that day. So what were the plans? So once you have that, that, that number of, of men that were involved, so 120 men go into the building you have them being told that they would go to there are a lot of uh, uh, areas in the building they would empty the staff or the rooms of the staff they would be gathered down the central hall in the custom house and they would be minded guarded by members of the active service unit and the squad um tins of paraffin were used and um, documents were to be gathered in the rooms prepared and basically windows are to be shut and when the rooms were ready to be fired then they would send word to Tom Ennis and he would give a whistle blast one single whistle blast and that would be the signal to basically set fire to the documents soaking and paraffin paraffin was chosen um, as the accelerant because it was less volatile using petrol in the attacks on the RIC barracks um, around the country. So petrol was too dangerous. And that information was given by the members of the fire brigade who themselves were either members of the Irish Citizen Army or the volunteers. Joe Connolly is crucial to the planning of uh, this operation. So they would do that. And once the fires had took hold, the men would then tell Tom Ennis they would then make their way downstairs and then two whistle blasts were the signal for the men to leave. It was time to take place between um, five to one and 20 past one. So literally a quick operation, get in, get out. Um, and then once the volunteers would leave, they would then let the staff go, mix in with the staff and go out that way. Um, communications were to be cut to the police stations, Dublin Castle and so on. That's where the engineers come in. And in the meantime, you would have those protective parties of the 1st Battalion, 3rd Battalion and 4th Battalion um, given that protective cover in and around Barrett's Place, Book Bridge and so on. Another essential part of the plan was the fire brigade stations were to be taken over by members of the IRA. So members of the sword, fourth and fourth battalions, they took over the fire stations in their areas. So you have Tara Street being taken over by K Company Tour Battalion, Thomas Street fire stations taken over by uh, members of the fourth battalion, Dorset Street, Buckingham Street, they're all taken over. Um, and basically, this is what happens. This is how the plan goes. So the men at about 10 to 1 start to descend on the custom house. So the main body, they enter. Um, the second battalion enter the building. Um, a lorry arrives with the tins of paraffin. They collect them as they go in. And then the staff are herded together, collected up, and then they're placed in the central hall and guarded by the members of the squad. Now, the communications were cut. Um, you have Michael Kremen actually climbing um, a pole in front of Star Street Police Station. Now, that's right in front of the custom house. They had a clear view um, of what was going on, but he cut communications. Um, and the thing was that they they didn't actually guess um, all of the communications. There was still a line available. Um, but the men arrived, the protective party, including men like Sean Prendergast and Dan Head and so on, they're all outside. So the volunteers go in. And the thing was with the staff, and there was a lot of staff in the building, um, even though they chose lunchtime, um, there was still a lot of staff in the building, and they chose lunchtime because there would be people going out of the building for lunch, but also it wouldn't be unusual to see people, say groups of men, groups of tradesmen going into the custom house during lunchtime, and all the volunteers pretty much were dressed up as tradesmen. Um, so it's chosen, that's the time chosen. Um, they they gathered up and it took a bit of time to gather up that staff and we do have accounts from uh, some of the staff that were there on that day and Daniel McAleese he has a witness statement in the Bureau of Military History and it's a fantastic account and um, 
basically given the perspective um, of what it was like to be a civilian in the building that day. And basically what he says was that he was in the dining room um, when the attack began and he looked towards the door and saw that three young men had entered the room with pointed revolvers and had ordered all the occupants to put their hands up. Where our hands extended above our heads, we were marched out in single files to the corridor where we joined where we joined a number of others, both the staff and the public. Several young men passed carrying tins of petrol. One of the leaders announced that the custom house had been set on fire and warned us against causing any commotion. Now, the thing was, initially, a lot of people didn't panic because there had been raids on buildings all around the city centre, even the custom house itself, and um, there was an attempted raid by the IRA. Um, but panic quickly sets in because while the volunteers were getting the rooms ready, um, somehow word got through to the military in Dublin Castle. And that's where F Company of the Auxiliaries were based. You also had them down in the L W War Hotel, um, just the, the, that red brick building before you come to the, the, the Point Depot. Q Company were based there, but word gets through to Dublin Castle, whether it's from someone ringing the, the Dublin Castle or what's possible is that it was a, a policeman passing by and saw that an awful lot of men were going into the custom house, that an awful lot of men were hanging around the custom house, but word did get through. And the military are deployed and they head down at about 10 past one. Now, the thing was, the volunteers on the outside, given that protective cover, had been told that they were not to open fire on the military. Um, if Unless the military opened fire on them, then they were to engage. The volunteers inside the building were armed with, uh, with revolvers, had six rounds of ammunition, and the men outside had grenades and guns. But some volunteers who were who arrived shortly before the operation began, um, they weren't told of this. And a volunteer saw the, the, the auxiliaries coming around by Liberty Hall and slowing down because the fire had been set in one of the rooms and he saw some smoke billowing out and he slowed down. And he thought that they've realised what's happening, they've, they're deliberately coming here, um, and he opened fire. Um, and and it, 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 um, he admits that, that he's the one that opened fire. And once that happens, all hell breaks loose. So you have the volunteers in the building, and they're obviously, they're trying to, to set fire to documents, but then once the gun battle ensues, they go to the windows and they engage in the gun battle with the auxiliaries. But then you have the auxiliary sort of sandwich between the volunteers in the custom house and then the volunteers outside who are in the surrounding area at Barrister Place. Um, also, you had members of the number four section active service unit that were on Book Bridge, including Patrick O'Connor, um, Paddy Rigney, I think Joe and Jimmy McGuinness were there as well. So you have have all of those um, areas being covered, but the military are also supported by armoured cars. They've got massive guns. You can see from this photograph, they're armed to the teeth. Um, there was machine guns and so on. The volunteers did have a machine gun, but it didn't come into play. Um, now, again, when the, the, when this, this gunfight breaks out, that's really when panic sets in amongst the, the, the crowd being held in the custom house. And again, we've got Daniel McAleese, the way he describes it. Um, the fire had been set. Um, and what he describes is the upper rooms were now heavily on fire. And as the thick and smoke descended to our congested quarters in the corridor, the atmosphere became almost unbearable. There were shouts and screams to open the door. At this stage, there was heavy machine gun and rifle fire outside. The crowd inside now became panicky and hysteria raged. Now, the thing was that they 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 couldn't, they were they were limited in how they could get out because they are surrounded, and of course, there's a gun battle going on. Now, at this moment, a, a second whistle blast was heard. And um, the thing was that Oscar, or sorry, Tom Ennis was the only one that was meant to have a whistle. Um, someone does blow a whistle and some of the volunteers hadn't finished preparing their rooms. They run to Ennis and say, we're not ready. He says, get back, prepare the rooms, do what you have to do. But that caused a slight delay. Um, and then finally the rooms are set alight, all the rooms are, are pretty much set alight. And then the 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 code or the, sorry, the uh, signal of two whistle blasts was given to evacuate the building after um the volunteers had used all their revolver ammunition and so on. Now, while the fire takes hold, of course, people, civilians 
ordinary people of Dublin, um, they noticed that there was a fire in the custom house. And it, the first thing you do, of course, what you would do is to ring the fire stations. And that's what happened. Phone calls were flooding into the fire stations that the custom house was 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 on, on fire. And all of the phone calls were answered. And the people were told help was on the way. Don't worry, help is going to come. Um, but help wasn't going to come because those who were answering the phones were the IRA. Um, in Tara Street, as I said, K Company, Tord Battalion, they're telling the people we're sending someone, we're sending someone, and no one was coming. Um, the thing was that it took the authorities a, a while to realise um, that something was up in Tower Street, like it's the closest fire station to the custom house. And about a half an hour after uh, the operation began, then they realised that they're not coming. No one's coming from Tower Street. What's going on? They sent um, a party over to sort of investigate. And there's great descriptions um, from some of the volunteers that were there that they describe it as, as the, uh, the the soldiers are trying to smash the door in to get into the fire station. Joe Connolly is barreling the, the IRA lads into the ambulance and then he's the one that drives away, gets them to safety, literally as the auxiliaries get into the building. And then Joe Connolly with a number of firemen arrive at the custom house and I mean, big inverted commas here to put out the fire. Um, they did the complete opposite. They're the ones that ensure that the building was destroyed. The idea was to destroy the contents of the building, destroy all those records, not the building itself. It was down to Joe Connolly, Tom Smart, uh, Tom Kavanagh, um, Mick Rogers and so on. They ensured that that building was destroyed. And to put it this way, if you look at Easter week, it took the fire brigade a day the fires were under control in a day. Um, same with Cork City in 1920. The fire brigade brought those fires under control. This was one building that burned for nearly 10 days. And that was because of the Dublin Fire Brigade, as who, as I said, were members of the Citizen Army and also the IRA. So what happens? There we have the fire brigade there and some of the fire stations. That's Thomas Street Fire Station just on the left that was occupied. It was in that building that you have Delia Young, who was a member of Coming Them On, one of the few women that's involved. Um, she cut the alarms and also stashed the guns of the volunteers. And their job was to steal the fire engine and drive out as far as Crumlin to prevent that fire engine getting in to um, help fight the fire. So what we have then on the inside, you have the, the fire taken hold, you have the volunteers engaging with um, the auxiliaries outside and two people that were outside were Oscar Trainer. So here we have him uh, on the top there. And then we have Paddy O'Daly. Now, he, Paddy O'Daly was um, the leader or one of the main leaders of um, Michael Collins' squad. But he was um, he was there on that day. He's a second battalion man as well. Um, but he couldn't get into the building. So he's outside and roughly around here under the loop line bridge is where Trainer and Paddy O'Daly were. They were right in the site of the auxiliaries so when the auxiliaries arrive literally O'Daly and a uh, trainer are, are caught who was watching this happen who saw two of his his commanding officers potentially in the line of fire was Dan Head and we have the descriptions from both trainer and O'Daly as to what happened next and just to read them out to you you have uh, Oscar Trainer's account here on the right. And he says, the sudden entry of the enemy put an end to our discussion. He was talking to all daily. As at this point, they were firing widely from the different lorries as they came through. Captain Daly made way towards Abbey Street. I made towards the support of the Loop Line Bridge opposite Brooks Thomas Building Stores. As I reached the road here, I came under fire from a lorry of black and tans. He's talking about the auxiliaries there. Um, but due to the speed and movement of the lorry, the firing was erratic. As I reached the pathway, however, the lorry had come to a halt. I was still being fired on and at the same time there were shouts of hands up. At this point I saw a young volunteer jump out from the cover of the bridge supports and throw a bomb in the middle of the black and tan lorry with disastrous effects to the occupants. I was later told that this volunteer was Dan Head and that he was killed either then or sometime later during the action. And here we have um, O'Daly's account from, the, from Dan's military pension file and what he says is that he was shot um, at my side, um, I think 28, no, sorry, he was shot dead. No, that's not him. Um, when Custom House was occupied by the IRA, the Tans came in lorries, which were then attacked by outside squad, of which I was one. He was killed 
by uh, by the volley by the first volley. I was not acquainted with him before the attack. He was a mere boy, and I certainly acted very bravely. And that fact that he was a mere boy, Dan was only seventeen years old at the time. And this is the photograph. This is an iconic photograph. And there are many, many iconic images of the Easter Rising, the War of Independence, the Civil War. And this is certainly one that relates to the War of Independence. And sadly, this shows Dan after he was killed. But as a result of his efforts, so his actions, where he threw the grenade, his MO, that's the way he operated throughout his period um, or his, his activity as an IRA man, that is what he did. Um, his actions saved the lives of Oscar Trainer and Paddy O'Daly because both of those men got away to safety. Um, Dan was just shy of 18. He would have been 18 in July, so 17 years old. He's the youngest volunteer to be killed that day. And here we see members of the staff um, walking past his body there. So Dan is one of five volunteers that lost their lives that day. Um, the others were the brothers, Patrick and Stephen O'Reilly. You have also Edward Dorrance, um, he was from East Wall, and then you have Sean Doyle. Now, once the, the IRA inside the building um, had their ammunition spent, um, once the fire had taken hold, they, the option was get out, try and get out, um, mixed with the staff. Now, the majority of them did that, um, but some like Jimmy Slattery, some like Sean Doyle, Tom Ennis, they decided, no, we'll, we'll, we'll try and escape. Tom Ennis was the last one to leave. Jimmy Slattery and uh, Sean Doyle make a run for it together. Both of them are shot. Uh, Slattery was shot in the hand. He later lost his hand. Sean Doyle was shot in the lungs. Somehow he managed to get to the Mara Hospital um, and he died as a result of his injuries on the 30th of May uh, 1921. His brother Patrick Doyle had been one that was executed, one of the IRA men that was executed in March uh, 1921. But they were the five volunteers that died that day. Um, in terms of the arrests, you have roughly 100 volunteers that were arrested that day. And they were taken forcibly to Arbor Hill Prison and then the majority of them were taken to Comanum Jail, but there were about 12 that were taken to Mount Joy, and these were men that were wanted, IRA men, and they were found with either bullets or guns um, on them uh, when they were arrested by the auxiliaries. The thing was, when the volunteers tried to mix with the staff coming out, you had the staff, um, the supervisors, were told by the auxiliaries to identify he was a member of staff. So obviously they didn't know the volunteers um, and then those who were not recognised were all put to one side and the majority of them were the volunteers and they're the ones who end up in Kilmainham Jail. Um, but the Custom House, it, it did, it was destroyed. The whole objective of destroying that, the contents of that building or the reason that that operation happened was to bring international attention on Ireland. That happened. There were reports in newspapers all across the world from the big name newspapers to the most obscure newspapers in the tiniest towns in America. Um, Le Perla, the French journal, they had a, 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 a double page spread showing a dramatic um, a sketch of what happened and what the day was like, what it was like to be inside that building. So it did have, um, the, the objective was achieved, what Eamon de Valera wanted. Um, also, the contents of the building were destroyed. It was the fire brigade that destroyed the building. Um, and I would argue that it is one of the events that helps lead to serious talks taking place about a truce. Um, you have within six weeks of this operation, the truce being declared. And despite the fact that the IRA had suffered those losses, so, you know, over 100 men in prison, um, and it did look to the authorities like the IRA were again on its knees. That night, the IRA were back out in the attack. Um, they changed the, the way they carried out attacks. So rather than having, you know, 20 or 30 men involved in the operation, um, they could use two or three men. They would light down head. They would use incendiary devices. So throw the grenades at a passing military uh, tender. 
They also changed um, who they attacked or what they attacked. They began to attack the supplies, the transportation. And you have um, the big fire in the Shell factory at Houston Station in June, again helped by the fire brigade. But that was one or two men that set this fire. But that took out the destruction that was caused. They took out armored cars. They took out um, military tenders, which that meant that, you know, a, a whole platoon of auxiliaries or soldiers could not get from point A to point B. And again, that increases the, the financial loss um, that the government were, uh, were, were, were suffering. So the IRA were, were not defeated. Um, now, as I said, 120 men involved, but they're the ones that were in the building. Um, the other battalions, the third, fourth and fourth, they lost very few of any men and that operation. They were all still carrying out um, the attacks and the ambushes after the custom house. One company of the 3rd Battalion were so active that they were actually told to stand down. The only company of volunteers that were that happened to because they were too active against uh, the, the, the Crown forces. So if you look at accounts by Joseph O'Connor, who was 3rd Battalion, um, Lima Flaherty, who was 5th Battalion, they said, their units weren't affected by the losses at customers. They were well able to carry on uh, the fight, which is what they did. But the losses felt personally by the IRA, especially of those five volunteers. It was felt hugely. Um, and the first year, the first anniversary of the burning of the custom house, which was in May 1922. So literally, what, a month before the Civil War began, a month before these men were going to start killing each other, there's a mass held in St. Agatha's Church um, in, in memory of those volunteers who lost their lives um, the year before in the born of the Custom House, including Dan Head. Um, the 1948, you have a committee being set up and a memorial was planned, and that is the memorial that is there today. Um, Dan Head himself was buried out in Kilbarrick, and here we have a photograph um, of Dan's uh, grave. Barrack, and then this photograph here shows Michael McKee and Michal Divlin um, at the grave this year because it was the centenary um, of the burning of the Custom House and of course Dan's death. Um, and here's the memorial and here's Dan's mother, Mary, um, at the memorial. It was unveiled in 1956 um, so it was the 25th anniversary of the burning. Um, it was unveiled by Sean T. O'Kelly, but a lot of the veterans who had taken part in the operation were present on that day, including Oscar Trainer. And whereas the volunteers felt the loss personally of Dan Head, Edward Dorans, Stephen and Peter O'Reilly and uh, Sean Doyle, we also have to remember that these were sons, um, their families felt the, the huge loss. Did he ever get over the loss of um, their, their, their son, their brother, their nephew, their, their cousin, their uncle dying in this conflict, given their lives for a, a free Ireland? Um, and Dan's, in, Dan's death had a huge impact on his family, um, on his mother. And of course, that story was replicated right across Ireland. There were so many empty chairs um, at the dinner tables, um, not just as a result of the Easter Eyes more of independence, but sadly then of the Civil War. And of course, it fell to the relatives, to the families, to the mothers to carry on that burden and accept somehow the fact that their child, their son, had made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom of their country, just as Dan Head did on the 25th of May, 1921. And just before I end, I would like to say a huge, huge thank you um, to the Gildare Decade of Commemorations Committee, to John Device Seminar, James Dorney and Kevin Murphy for the technical support. And of course, Michael McKee and uh, Dan's relatives, Michal Divlin and uh, Military Archives Dublin for the great work that they do in releasing all of these records. And of course, a huge, huge thank you to you, the audience, for tuning in and listening to me. Thanks very much. <laughs>